This morning we're continuing in the Gospel of John. We've now reached uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6, as you know, is quite a long and full chapter. Uh, Jesus is going to do something between the time he feeds the 5,000 and the time he actually uh, begins to expound on what it is that he did and who he is in the later part of the chapter. But this morning we're going to focus just on that miracle itself. So we're going to read John chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. We read uh, um, in beginning in verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. And the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now this morning, as uh, I've already noted, we come to one of the most familiar miracles that Jesus did during his earthly ministry. Uh, Familiar to us either because uh, we were taught it so frequently in our Sunday school classes, because, you know, Sunday school classes we like to relate to the children we're teaching. And here we have the story of a small lad who was willing to give up his lunch, as it were, the five loaves and two fish, so that others may eat. Perhaps we're familiar with it because of that, or because it is the only miracle that all four Gospels record. And if you're reading through your Bible, you come across this particular uh, miracle, uh, well, at least once for each Gospel you've read. Now John, as we've already noted, tends to write about the things that the other Gospel writers actually leave out. Uh, He fills in the gaps, as it were, to offer further proof to us that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. Now, if that's the case, why does he record this miracle, knowing that the other authors had already recorded it, realizing that John wrote his gospel, I believe, last of the four? Well, likely it's because he wanted to show the context of something that he alone records, And that is the Bread of Life discourse that we're going to get to at the end of this chapter. And that's where Jesus gets into the heart of what he's actually doing here. This morning, though, I thought in preparation for that, that we would consider basically two things. That we would look at this miracle itself and then get a glimpse into what it is that Jesus would have us uh, learn from it. So first of all, let's consider the miracle itself. And the first thing that John tells us is where the miracle actually took place. And we see that in verse 1. After After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. And Luke is even more specific in his introduction to this miracle in his gospel. In Luke 9, verse 10, he writes this. When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all they had done, all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. Bethsaida is basically on the, um, on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it happens to be the hometown of Philip and Andrew and Peter. 
Now, secondly, he tells us who the witnesses and recipients of this miracle uh, actually were. Uh, Aside from his disciples, we read in verse 2, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Basically, the recipients were those who were following Jesus because they had seen his miracles. Basically, miracles were drawing them after Jesus. And they wanted to see more of these miracles. Or maybe they wanted Jesus to heal them. Uh, As we're going to see at the end of this chapter, they weren't following Jesus necessarily because they believed in Jesus. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of them didn't. Now, miracles, as we know in Scripture, tend to draw people after Jesus. They tend to to cause people to follow Jesus, but they don't necessarily bring these people savingly to Him because that was not the purpose of miracles. Miracles do not have the power to convert, at least not these kinds of miracles. And yet, Jesus continued to do them because he knew his Father was going to use them to gather people to him in order to listen to what he has to say, but also that it might leave those who didn't believe in him without excuse. Miracles are are basically meant to prove that the messenger was sent from God. Now, you and I know today that the Lord doesn't work in exactly the same way today as he did back then. God isn't doing miracles all the time, obviously, because otherwise we might see those things happening and we might be marveling at those things ourselves. It's not to say God doesn't do miracles, but he doesn't give people the ability to do miracles to prove his word because he's already done that. He's already authenticated his messengers. We know that we have the word of God in Scripture And yet, we do know that God does a very important miracle today, and that is the miracle of the new birth, which he does through the word he's already given to us through the gospel. But we do need to remember that the miracle that he does, of course, through this gospel is something, again, that uh, he only does among those whom he will. Not everybody that we witness to is going to experience this miracle, even as the many who listened to Jesus Christ did not necessarily trust in him and follow him. This is a miracle God gives when and where he wills. But the point is, some will come. He will do this work in some, even as Jesus knew when he did his miracles, that some who came and listened to him preach the gospel would be converted. He was sent out to gather his lost sheep, and he knew the Father would do that. But it was through the preaching of the gospel And as we preach the gospel today, as we bear witness to it, as we share it with others, God will gather his people together. That should encourage us to keep on sharing it. Sometimes we look at the people and realize there's going to be a lot of people perhaps that aren't going to receive it, and we don't like that response, but we do need to remember there are going to be those who do, and it's for those people particularly that we go out and we share this gospel Now, thirdly, we see something of the setting of this miracle in verse 3. John writes, Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Again, were they resting on top of the mountain? Uh, Perhaps. Or was this another situation like the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus takes the place of the teacher, or he he sits, he takes this place of authority, and his disciples sit down around him, presumably, to be taught. Perhaps this is another teaching situation like it was on the Sermon on the Mount. Or he may have simply gone up to the mountain so that he could be more easily seen by the crowd which he knew was coming since it was the Father's will shortly to show these people who he really is. Well, fourthly, John tells us when this took place in verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Uh, To be near to the Passover typically meant that it was basically a month away, or at least within a month. This likely may have been the third Passover that our Lord celebrated during his ministry. There's some question as to whether he uh, celebrated three or four Passovers. It probably doesn't really matter, but it could have been either because his ministry lasted for three and a half years. The first time is when he cleansed the temple towards the beginning of this gospel in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. 
Uh, the second observance may have been when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, which is what we saw in the last chapter. Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem for a feast. If that was the Passover, it was now nearly a year since the events of that last chapter that we've just been looking at. John doesn't seem to cover the time frame in between, probably because it was covered by the other gospel writers. Now, I only bring this out to mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, John is telling us that these events took place at a certain time and in a certain location. In other words, they took place in real time and space history. Uh, this, is not, uh, this, this story isn't introduced with the words, once upon a time there was a man named Jesus, and Jesus you know, did this, and he did that, and he fed these people, and so forth, as though this was some kind of a myth, legend, or fairy tale that never really happened. The miracle that we're about to read of is a miracle that took place that really happened at this time and in this location, and let's not forget why, that we may know who Jesus is. Secondly, it's possible that Jesus did the miracle that he was about to do because the Passover was actually near. Uh, Passover is celebrated on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Sometimes, you know, we kind of wonder how all these feasts fit together. But it basically kicks it off, which means at the Passover feast, they would use only unleavened bread, which is one of the reasons why we use unleavened bread in our serving of communion, because undoubtedly this is what Jesus used to establish this practice, because it's a picture of Jesus, that he is the unleavened bread, which is a picture of sinlessness. Perhaps Jesus did this particular miracle with this bread at this time to show us not only that he is the Lamb of God, the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world, but that he is also the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that if one eats of it, he or she will live forever. As a matter of fact, Paul makes this very connection when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. He says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus is our Passover lamb who's been sacrificed. He is the one who takes away our sins and makes us unleavened. But the unleavened bread is also a picture of his sinlessness and the bread which is broken for us in order that we may have life. So it's a picture of Jesus. Perhaps he was doing this miracle with bread at this time as an, an added, as it were, attention drawer that he would be represented by the bread or the unleavened bread in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me mention also, by the way, the fact that Jesus is the bread and he is in fact unleavened also calls us, as Paul just wrote, to make sure that we are also unleavened, that we trust Jesus and repent of all of our sins and live as much as possible a sinless life. In other words, that we listen to what Jesus says and build our lives on that foundation of his teaching, that we act upon what he says, that we don't be ignorant of it, but read it and listen and do, because that is what is going to make us secure. That is what is going to give us the foundation we need to survive, especially when it comes to the day of his judgment. Now, fifthly, we see the miracle itself, beginning with a question that Jesus asks Philip in verses 5 and 6. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Now, according to the other Gospels, Jesus first came down from the mountain. He taught the multitude. He healed them. You know, he did additional miracles. And then when it was getting late, the disciples wanted to send them all away, but Jesus didn't want to. It's a desolate place. That's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to feed them. Of course, he wanted to do this miracle to show them further who he was. And so he turns to Philip. 
And he asks, where might they buy bread? Now, as we saw already, Philip was from Bethsaida, as also Andrew and Peter. And if anyone knew where to get bread in that area, he would have been the one. So perhaps Jesus was saying that for that reason. And yet it's clear that that wasn't the only reason he was asking Philip. Because he knew the area, he was asking him to test him. He was asking Philip or testing Philip to see whether or not Philip would look to himself to meet that need, whether he would look to Bethsaida and to some baker in that area, whether he would look to the disciples and their personal resources, or whether he would look to Jesus in order to meet this particular need. Now sadly, Philip failed the test. He looked to human uh, means and not to divine means. In verse 7, we read this, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. Now, you already know that a denarius was a day's wage, and he's basically saying the amount that a person could make working for 200 days wouldn't be enough to feed this crowd, even to give them a little bit, not to mention satisfying their hunger. Now, did Philip choose that number because he had that much money? Did he choose that number because that's how much was in the disciples' bag, you know, that Judas was continually pilfering from? It seems unlikely that they were carrying around 200 days' wages. That's actually a significant chunk of money. It's more likely he chose a large round number to point out that even if they did have that much, it wouldn't come close to feeding this multitude not to mention the fact it'd be difficult to find a baker that happened to have that much bread on hand. I mean, 5,000 is a large group of people. Now, the problem here is that Philip was speaking as though Jesus was nothing more than just an ordinary man, like he was talking to another disciple. You can almost hear Jesus saying to him, how long, or have I been with you, as he says in John 14, verse 9, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? Philip, you see, Philip wasn't even thinking that Jesus might be able to meet this need. He was trying to think of other ways that they might be able to meet this particular need. Now, while Philip was trying to work this out, another one of the disciples spoke up. You see, this wasn't a private conversation. And we read in verses 8 and 9, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Well, Andrew's response really wasn't much better than Philip's. Now, here's a child who has five loaves and two fish. The loaves, we're told, were made from barley, which basically means, because they weren't made of wheat, that this was a poor man's meal. And the word that was used here for fish basically means small, pickled, salted fish or tidbits of meat, which really didn't amount to much. This child was here, and, and the word lad means a small boy, was with the crowd either trying to sell this food or perhaps he had brought this along. You know, his mother had packed him a lunch or a dinner and, and he was carrying it along and he was intending to eat it himself. But either way, it was a small amount of food. You know, a small little thing of food. We can't imagine he was carrying like five huge loaves of bread. It was, wasn't nearly enough to feed 5,000 uh, humanly speaking, the disciples were basically helpless. They looked around and they said, there's no way we're going to be able to do this, Jesus. But Jesus, of course, had them exactly where he wanted them to be. The Lord will often call us to do things that are too difficult for us and cause us, as it were, to run to the end of our resources. After we take inventory, we see we, we can't do it. We don't have the ability to do this, Jesus. But then when he has brought us to that point, he teaches us what we need to learn in the first place, which is to trust Him. To trust Him to give us the ability to carry out His will. By the way, that's a huge area in and of itself, a very important uh, application of this text, which is why we're going to look at that this evening. Uh, we'll follow up on that this evening, but we're not going to have time to do that this morning. But do tuck that away. But once they had been brought to this place, Jesus now steps in and He acts. Verse 10. Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about 
5,000. They didn't have anything to give to these people, but Jesus did, and so he had them sit down. John tells us there were 5,000 men who were present, and the word he uses there specifically means men and not just generic people which means that there were probably many more people than just 5,000. There may have been women and children present as well. I think likely that was the case. John continues in verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish as much as they wanted. Now, did... um, (laughs) Did the disciples go and grab the food out of the child's hand and start giving it to the people? No. If he was selling them, they probably bought it. If the lad was offering the food up, he gave it freely. But after Jesus received it, he thanked God for even that small amount of food. Remember, the Lord tells us that we always need to receive the gifts that God gives to us, and everything we receive from Him is a gift, even every breath of air. We need to receive it with thankfulness because we don't deserve it. It's a gift from God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. So we receive it with thankfulness. Jesus gives thanks. And then he gave the bread and the fish to his disciples, as the other uh, gospel writers tell us. We're not to assume that Jesus actually went out and and broke it and gave it to 5,000 people. He had his disciples there to help him. And then as they gave it to the crowds, He didn't give them just a little, but he gave them as much as they wanted. And as we look at what the other gospel writers say about this event, Jesus came down, he taught them, Jesus healed them. It was now dinner time and so forth. They were hungry. They must have wanted much because it was late. And not only did all these people eat from the five loaves and two fish until they were full, We might say until they were satisfied or perhaps even stuffed, depending upon their particular disposition. There were even leftovers. John writes in verses 12 and 13. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. And I should mention the word indicates here that these were not small baskets, but these were large baskets. These were the kind of baskets you would take to market in order to fill with food so that you would have food for the week. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it it proves to us that not only was this not some kind of mass, you know, illusion that Jesus convinced the people they were eating when they really weren't eating. There were 12 baskets full of, of evidence left over from all the fragments, It says just from the bread, perhaps there were bits of meat in there as well. But the fact that there were 12 of them also serves, or we should say that these baskets also serve as a reward for the disciples for what they had just done. Because the disciples had served all these people and yet had not yet eaten. They put Jesus' work, as it were, first. And then Jesus provides for their needs. Again, let me just remind you what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You see, you never lose when you put the Lord first, when you serve Him first in whatever He calls you to do or whatever He calls you to give. The Lord will always provide for you. He will always take care of you. As a matter of fact, we might say He will do abundantly beyond all we can ask or think, but we do need to put Him first as the example of the disciples shows us here. Now, finally, we see their response. Verse 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, again, we just want to remind ourselves here, this is the main reason Jesus did this miracle. 
I do want you to notice that everything that Jesus did, for the most part, I think, except maybe for the withering or the cursing of the fig tree, maybe there's other examples, but for the most part, they all benefited people in more than one way. That cursing of the fig tree certainly was a benefit to his disciples when they saw it happen. But when he heals and when he feeds, when he raises the dead, when he casts out demons, all of these things always benefit individuals, which is good. And he doesn't just make small rocks bigger. He doesn't raise up mountains, put down mountains. That doesn't really benefit anyone. But what he does is beneficial, but it is in more than one way. It not only helps them physically, it's meant to help them spiritually. And the main reason why Jesus did these miracles was to prove who he really was. Remember, that's why John wrote these miracles down, was so that we might know that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is, in this case, the prophet that Moses predicted that we saw in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. We know that there is a connection between those two and that that is, in fact, who Moses was speaking about because when Peter preached the healing of the lame man at the temple, we read this in Acts 3, verses 22 through 26. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophet and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Jesus is the prophet that Moses spoke of. By the way, I want you to pay attention to the fact that everyone who does not listen to this prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? He says, those of you who hear my words and don't act upon them, I'll show you what you're like. You're like a man who built his house on the sand and the winds came and the the rains fell and the floods came and that house fell and it was great. The great was the fall of that house. Everyone who doesn't listen to him will be destroyed, but those who listen, by the way, they'll be destroyed for their sins because Jesus is the only way to escape the consequences of sin. But those who listen will be like those who build their house on the rock. They will be firm. They'll be secure. They will stand in the day of judgment. They won't fall. They won't be destroyed. They will be saved. Jesus is the prophet whom the Jews knew that Moses was speaking about, he was speaking about the Messiah. And when they said this, they were saying, Jesus is not just the prophet, Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, exactly what it is that John was trying to prove by his recording of these particular miracles to his audience. They saw and they recognized it. But I want you to remember that even though they said this, that at the end of this chapter, they're all going to withdraw from Jesus because they do not believe in him. It's not enough to know that he is the Messiah. You actually have to receive this Messiah. Now basically, this is the point I'd like to end on this morning. Jesus said earlier in John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he, he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Of all the things that Jesus has done to this point, this is, I think, arguably the greatest that he had done in order that they might marvel, that they might, as it were, the traffic might be stopped, they might be amazed, and they might listen to what Jesus has to say because of what he did. Now, you probably are aware the liberals believe if this story has any truth in it at all, that it's really a story about a young lad's unselfish offering of his lunch that basically moved the crowds to pull their own lunches out of their sleeves, as it were, out of hiding, and begin to share what they had with one another. 
If there was any miracle that took place here, in their estimation, it was basically the miracle of giving. But the truth is that this lad was the only one who had any food. And Jesus multiplied that food through divine power. He did a miracle. He did a greater work so that they might marvel. Did he make more bread and fish out of nothing? Is this creation, as it were, ex nihilo, as God spoke in the beginning, let there be and there was? Maybe. Or did he draw the substance from the surrounding creation and cause it to transform into fish and bread? Or, Well, it could have been. One way or the other, he multiplied it. We know that. And that's something that only God can do. This was an act of divine power. This was the father's testimony to his son. That here was the prophet. Here was the Messiah. Here is the one who is the bread of life, who comes down from heaven, that if a man eats of it, that is, if he trusts in the Lord Jesus, he will never die but live forever. And this is what the Father is showing you this morning through this particular text. That his love for sinners was so great that he was willing to give his only son so that if you would only believe in him, if you'd only reach out to him in faith, which means to trust in his death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and trust in his righteousness, his obedience to make you acceptable. Not only will the Lord actually forgive you of all your transgressions, but he will clothe you with the perfect righteousness of his son. He will adopt you into his family and he will take you up into heaven forever when it comes time for you to die. In other words, from that rock in which you've built your house, as it were, your life, you will simply ascend into heaven when you die and not sink into hell because of your sins. And so I would simply ask you this morning this question. Have you done this? Have you heard the prophet? Do you believe this is the prophet? Have you listened to him? Did you hear what he said? Do you more than just like this crowd believe this is the prophet? Yes, I know Jesus is the prophet. I believe all those things to be true. But you haven't acted on it. You haven't actually trusted him. You haven't actually received him. You haven't fed on this living bread, as it were, that comes down out of heaven. You haven't turned from your sins. From everything that you've done or are doing that is contrary to God's commandments. And you haven't trusted Jesus. That is rest on him and rely on him alone to get you into heaven. It's not enough to believe that he is the Messiah or to know that he is the Messiah. You actually have to trust him. There's a big difference between those two things. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between those who have saving faith and this, the faith of devils who also believe they know these things are true and they tremble, but they're not saved because you actually have to trust in Jesus, you actually have to receive him. You actually have to, as it were, by faith, feed upon this living bread. If you haven't done that, I pray that you will. And receive the life that Jesus offers to you freely this morning. He says, whoever will may come. And he will not turn you away. He won't turn anyone away who comes to him. So if you haven't come to him, come to him this morning. And receive that life that he offers to you. And live forever. Know that you are secure and safe from the judgment you might otherwise receive for your sins. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our lives as we need to hear it.